All right, welcome to our June webinar, everybody. You know, I have been, we've been talking a lot uh, this year about inventory levels um, and really the surprising lack of inventory. We started 2023 with dramatically more inventory year over year. And then during the year, we've had more buyers and sellers and inventory has fallen really dramatically. Available inventory of homes to buy has fallen really dramatically. We're in what I call a supply constrained market. In other words, if there was more homes to, to buy, we would have more transactions. It's not, uh, you know, we have obviously, as rates have risen, affordability is less, demand is less than it was at the peak of the frenzy uh, during the pandemic. But because inventory is so restricted, we have more buyers and sellers and inventory is falling or has been falling. We've finally turned the corner for the year. And really the question is, what are the conditions that are going to lead to greater inventory? Finally seeing some inventory. There's a lot of talk about mortgage rate lock-in. Uh, I am going to, I hope, uh, share some insight about where where we think and when we think inventory could come, how to, how to think about mortgage rate lock-in, uh, how it exists, where it does, and where it maybe doesn't. And, and I'm going to try to to dispel some what I think are myths about the inventory situation. So a lot of that today. Um, and so we will dive in. If you're new to these webinars and Altos Research, Altos tracks every home for sale in the country every week. We analyze all the pricing, all the supply and demand, all the changes in that data, and then we make it available to you before you see it in the traditional channels. You know, we do every Monday a video with the latest national data. Then once a month, we spend an hour or so diving into all the details and into uh, some of the local markets. So this is where we get time to dive into the some of the local markets. Um, and so that's what is on our agenda today. We will, we're going to start with the inventory, the myths and the realities, where it's coming from, when it might come. Uh, we will look, of course, at home price trends and what we can see for the rest of the year. Uh, we're also spending a lot of time with the pendings data these days and the sales trends. So what we can see for sales that will complete in July and August that we can already see in the data. Uh, and then we will, of course, spend some time with local data, local markets. And all the way through the conversation, I am I will be trying to frame it in how we can communicate with home buyers and sellers right now. We're in this, I mean, the, the market's crazy. Uh, it has been completely surprising. Surprising to me uh, that we started the year in uh, coming off of rising inventory last year, home prices falling, lots of price reductions, and all of those trends have turned around. Uh, and so your buyers and sellers may not have any idea that that's happening. So when we need to present uh, information that maybe is contrary to a narrative that somebody already has in their head, how can we do it? What are the, what's the right frame? What are the questions we can ask? And, and uh, I'll try to share those along the way. As I mentioned, uh, Jeff Graves and Leo Black are in the chat. They're from the Altos team. And as we are going along, we can uh, you can use the chat to ask questions um, and, and also look for links and things. And speaking of links, uh, here's one right now. Uh, all the data that I talk about today is available in the Altos product, and and we have written a free ebook about how to use market data in your business. So if you haven't already downloaded the ebook, uh, you should grab it now. Uh, it's free. It has scripts. It has ideas and strategies for talking about the data. Uh, and and referencing a lot of the same things that I referenced in the the video today. So uh, if you don't already have it, I I suggest you go grab it. There's a link for that in the chat. You can click through and go uh, grab that that um, ebook now. All right, let's start diving right into some of the data. Uh, let's start with the inventory. Current available inventory on the market in the U.S. is 443,000 single-family homes. And all the data I'm using in the charts here that today are single-family homes. Um, the 
The uh, inventory is just starting to tick up. So it's up one and a half percent from last week. And it is still 11.7% higher than last year at this time. So in this chart, the dark red line is this year, the curve from this year. You can see that it started on the left-hand side, started higher uh, than the uh, 2021 and 22, um, and but but adjusted very quickly. And last year, the light red line, inventory was climbing by three, four, five percent per week right now at this time. And uh, as mortgage rates had been spiking and that the demand had slowed down, supply sellers hadn't slowed, uh, investors, people who had projects in the works, none of that had slowed. In fact, some of that got accelerated from the second half of the year and pulled in, listed for sale in May and June of last year in July. So inventory was rising very quickly. And right now it's up one and a half percent. June is really the peak of the new listing period. And so there is very little signal of any surge of inventory anywhere in the data for the rest of the year. And so, you know, the big question for today, for the webinar today is, when will we get new inventory? Um, because the second half of the year uh, is usually declining inventory, usually peaks in August and then declining uh, in the second half of the year, um, it is unlikely that we're going to get any um, a surge of inventory. You can see last year in September, the second week of September, mortgage rates at that time, that's the light red line, the, the mortgage rates at that time spiked from five and a half to six and a half to seven and a half percent. And inventory did climb at that point. So that was demand weakening. Uh, and so nothing was, none of those purchases were happening. And so we could see a climb, a surprising climb in inventory in September and October of last year to, to finally start declining in, in, uh, the set in November and December. Um, what we can see this year, so this is the same inventory data in uh, a chart that I pulled from our advanced analytics platform. And in what we can see here is, is the curves, the bouncing curves from each year. The dot is where we are this point in the year, the second week of June each year. And you can see how normally the the dot by the second week of june we're near the peak of inventory for the year you can see how uh you know in 2017 18 19 we're almost to the peak uh then the pandemic hit and the the assumptions change this year uh even and even last year in 2022 we were already halfway up the curve of inventory climbing for the year this year we're barely turning and yet we're probably near the peak of inventory for the year and it'll start declining probably in, uh, in August probably hit the peak absolute peak in August and start declining again so we've got maybe six eight more weeks of uh, of inventory to climb but it's you can see it's uh, not a very steep climb and normally we're we're near the peak we're usually you know flat across the peak of summer where it, it, homes are being bought and listed, but but not a ton of new listings happening. And so what that shows us is that we're probably pretty near the peak of new listings for the year, 443,000. And then at the end of the year, it's gonna start falling back down. So like this is th this pro projection of where we normally are in the year. And it's a really powerful to see how little inventory has come in uh this year how, how little inventory buildup has happened and why we're in a supply constrained market um so let's talk about why the 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 big myth that i want to uh dispel today is that uh it is i hear common um a common assumption that if we had lower mortgage rates if mortgage rates fell back down again that we would that that would give us more inventory because people uh, have an affordability hurdle and therefore they can't sell their first home and they can't buy the next home and they're sitting on their hands. So that's the assumption. I'd like to point out that uh, the data shows that if we have if we were to get lower rates, especially notably lower rates, we'll probably end up with less inventory 
rather than more. Lower rates leads to less inventory. And why is that? Well, it turns out because lower rates makes it cheaper to own and to hold. And so we don't sell. And we can look at this over time. So the gray line here is that same inventory chart over multiple years. You can see since this one starts in 2015 and every year we have fewer, have had fewer and fewer homes available on the market when rates were in the threes and fours. The one year that that changed when inventory rose was in 2018. And right in the middle of the chart, you can see there is this uh, orange part. So the, the, this is, the colored line is mortgage rates over time. And the, the color, the orange color, that's the 2018 period. Mortgage rates rose through all of 2018. And you can see that January of 2019 had more inventory than the year before. The only year that like that until now of the entire past decade. Mortgage rates rose and led to more inventory. Not mortgage rates falling. Mortgage rates falling leads to less inventory. Then of course we had in the pandemic, uh, 2019, 2021 rates dramatically falling and inventory dramatically falling as well. It became significantly cheaper to hold that property because my rates were so low. And therefore, even if I'm buying another one, I'm not selling the first one. We have now all that refi boom. So 98% of the homeowners in the country have dramatically below market rates on their mortgage, which means it is dramatically cheaper to hold and not sell. Last year, then we have the the reverse. Obviously, the the this this uh, maroon colored part, portion of the line was rates spiking last year, climb, 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 and inventory climbed with it. So higher rates led to greater inventory last year, and uh, and then this year rates have been have been bouncing around flat. The bright red line is the is the 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 portion mortgage rates this year. And we can see that rates actually fell a little bit, inventory fell, bounced around. And so in this band, inventory uh, rates are not changing and, and inventory is not dramatically rising. We have, um, what we have at a point now and looking to the future. So in the future, higher mortgage rates, what'll happen is we will reset the cost basis for the next bunch of owners. So 5 million transactions a year, you have now maybe two, three years, 15 million homes with significantly higher costs. Now, when those owners want to go move or uh, maybe buy a second home, now the, because the, the holding cost on those is higher, now I have to put it back into the market. I have to sell it. I need that equity to put a bigger down payment on my next one. It's cheaper to, it's more expensive to hold. My rent isn't as good or or just to hold with no rent. Um, with, with, with folks who have, with our mortgage rates at three and below, it's so cheap that that we're just holding them. And so it is our view that multiple years of higher mortgage rates is what will lead to higher, greater inventory selection for buyers. We have less hoarding of homes that'll happen. And that's the real um, the real myth that I wanted to spell, that, that it's lower rates that's going to get us more inventory. Lower rates, I would expect, will get us more transaction volume. We'll get faster buying, we'll get more hoarding, we'll have fewer sellers. So lower rates will stimulate demand, but we but we are in a supply constrained market. So we won't get that many more transactions. Uh, we will have, uh, but lower rates will not stimulate supply. And isn't that interesting? So um, we will, so what we expect is so that's the main uh, higher rates for multiple years will get us to a greater inventory level. We can also look at uh, at this view of inventory, which is each uh, of these, each of the colored segments here is a year and each bar is the change in inventory in a given week. So when it's below the line, that's inventory is falling. There are more, more buyers, more absorbed, fewer new sellers. Uh, you can see right in the middle of the chart, the light blue section, that's 2020. We only had a 
few weeks in all of 2020 where inventory grew. Most of it, uh, the year inventory was just cratering every week. Uh, you can see the dark blue at the right end of the chart. That's uh, that's last year. And we had those big spikes of inventory change. You can see how the bars are taller than any previous years. And that was inventory climbing as the market was under this dramatic shift with rates went from, from you know 2.8% to 7.5% in that less than a year. And that that rise in rates was what built inventory at the time. Earlier in the year, if you saw this forecast from us, we could see the 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 light, the pink at the far right, and our each week what our model forecasts for the inventory change for the rest of the year. Um, earlier in the year, we were expecting the trends from 2022 to continue forward and inventory to be growing. We were expecting we've had you know recessions about uh, signals about recessions potentially coming for a, a, over a year now, and so a slowing economy. Um, we were expecting in there. That hasn't happened. Um, we can see that we had last year, part of the reason the inventory change happened was because investors were buying fewer homes. Demand from investors dropped dramatically in the second half of last year. And uh, those investors have actually picked up the pace this year. And so the forecast used to assume that some investors would be selling now. They haven't been selling. So none of those of, of so potential sources of inventory have been uh, have come in uh, in the distressed seller, the, the scenario where we have a slowing economy, we have recessions and a job loss recession. And now you have people who can't make their mortgage payment. Inventory from recession is significantly behind when the recession actually happens, when the job losses happen. And so it's about at least 12, more like 18 months after the job losses before you really start seeing that inventory come to the market. So we're still at really full employment now, uh, assuming you know recession finally hits, job losses accelerate in the second half of the year, and maybe by the end of the year, we start seeing some unemployment levels. Then you can imagine that then there's, you know, if I lose my job and I try to find a new job, now it, I'm out of work for 90 days. Now I stop paying my mortgage or now I have to negotiate with a bank. It's another 90 days before I really get in trouble. It's six months from the time of the job loss. And so if they just start at the end of the year, you can see how that's all of a sudden the end of 2024 or probably 2025 before we see any inventory from a slowing economy. Um, you know, those recession signals have been around for over a year. And so, you know, they could have been showing up now, but but we haven't had the job losses yet. So again, this is another reason why we, we uh, don't foresee dramatically increased inventory will remain in a supply constrained market. And so demand will, will increase or decrease with rates. It gets less affordable and therefore demand is off. Uh, if demand is up, we will see transaction volume pick up, but the selection will be tight. The competition will increase. The inventory, available inventory will not increase. And so then here's what the, the projection looks like of inventory for the rest of the year. So this is the same chart as that first one. Uh, each line here is the curve of inventory for the year. The uh, the dark red line is this year, and the dots are how we project what's going to happen out for the rest of the year. Uh, last year, the light red line, you know, was was increasing by three, four, five percent per week, and really steep. Um, and this year, that trend is entirely different. And so we will see how. We're going to end the year. We have 443,000 single family homes on the market right now. We expect six, eight weeks more of climbing and then a uh, and then a, a normal seasonal fall off at the end of the year. Uh, then that would imply we're going to end 2023 with fewer homes on the market than we started. So in fact, by you can see by middle of July, we'll have uh, negative year over year uh, uh, inventory. So in the middle of July, we'll have fewer homes, negative inventory year over year. We all we could have lower mortgage rates year over year, 
and we could have higher home prices year over year by July. And like that is just a such a surprising difference from how we started 2023. And uh, I didn't have it anywhere in, in the forecast, but that's really what those pieces are looking like. Um, we could see uh, this could get revised. The dotted line here could get revised lower, fewer homes, if, for example, rates fall and we stimulate demand. So like I said, lower rates will stimulate demand and result in fewer homes on the market, more competition, more buyers, but but not more sellers. And so this could actually fall, you know, the dotted line could actually fall below 2020 by the end of the year. Um, and, uh, uh, but, but not back, I don't anticipate back to the 2021, that ultra low curve, because those were the 2.8% mortgage rates uh, and a ton of, of economic growth. And so people were buying everything in sight. So that's really where that where the uh, the curve looks for the rest of the year. And like I mentioned, in July we could have we could be at this point where we have negative year over year inventory growth. We could have positive uh, home prices and lower mortgage rates than we did a year ago. So that's like a really really surprising uh, trend. Okay. And why haven't we, like, how do we know that that this is coming? Well, we can look each week uh, at the rate of new listings and the demand. So the supply is the rate of new listings and the demand as measured by what we call our immediate sales. And the immediate sales are, you know, house gets listed and it takes offers that afternoon or maybe the next day and it, it goes into contract by Saturday and it's and uh, it's already sold. It, spent, it spends essentially zero time as active inventory. It's already taking offers by the time it gets listed for sale. Um, that was that immediate sales was a was a, a phenomenon during the pandemic, and uh, and really exploded, especially when you know we could do bidding wars when rates are two point eight percent. You can overbid by a hundred thousand dollars and not have your payment change very much. Now with rates at seven percent, you have to be much more. Uh, careful about that. So we see fewer immediate sales happening now. Of course, we have lower demand now. It's less affordable. Each of those payments is is uh, significantly more difficult. Uh, but we also see uh, how many fewer new listings we have each week, because um, you know we we have the 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 supply and the demand side of that higher mortgage rate. So right now there's eighty two thousand. Single family homes were listed for sale this week. And right at the end of June is really where we typically get our greatest listing volume. Um, last year, there were 115,000 new listings. Of those, uh, 25 or more thousand of those went into contract uh, immediately. This week, uh, 18,000 immediate sales. The immediate sales has picked up this this spring. So you can you can see how the, the, the immediate sales is the light portion of the bar in each, each week. You can see how the end of last year, the around the holidays, September, October, November, fewer and fewer immediate sales, really cold uh, um, demand. And it, you can also see how that stopped after July 4th last year, just, you know, we moved us onto an entirely new curve, fewer sellers at that time. So this is what our supply constrained market looks like. There are no signals that this is going to change. Um, uh, like, But if rates stay elevated for multiple years, you can see that each year, maybe we have gradual new increase because we have fewer people with their, their ultra cheap uh, mortgages that they never, that they want to hoard, never sell. Okay. Let's switch to pricing. The, uh, Median home price in the U.S. of single-family homes this week is four hundred fifty-four thousand nine hundred dollars. It's um, that is up a tick from the a week ago, and the end of June is when we reach our seasonal peak in the asking prices for the home. Right, we have the second quarter; all the best listings are happening. That is because you know if you have a um, you list a home at the end of June and you take a offer and july and it closes in august all of a sudden you're right around school time in the fall if you start listing in july like now you want to you start doing a little bit of a discount to make sure that it doesn't stick around too late in the summer and so you can see that that's the curve the annual curve that happens uh each year 
Uh, home prices are essentially unchanged from last year, just, just a little bit lower below the peak of last year. Um, and uh, this was, we could see this curve coming. And if you, if you watch these videos or the, the webinars all year, we could see that you could see how the dark red line here, that's the, the median price of the, all the homes on the market, uh, was climbing very steeply last year. And this year, it was a much less steep. So we could see right now that we were going to end the year uh, at flat or maybe just below the home prices from last year. What's interesting is that we have, because demand has been stronger than I anticipated, uh, the second half of the year could also be a less steep decline than than last year's second half of the year, which would mean we could end the year up in home prices. Home prices, you know, flat to up, um, and you know that was what nobody had that in in any forecast scenario from from six eight months ago. Uh, but that's what where the demand is, and you know we have more demand. Then supply, we have a supply constricted market. And so as a result, that's keeping a floor on home prices. We could see that anytime, you know, markets where you had prices drop down, there's enough cash, people were buying those homes and keeping a floor on, on home prices. Um, the median price of the new listings, that's the light colored line here, that's $420,000. That ticked up this week too. And it's also right around its peak. It's a little bit lower than last year at this time. And if we look at the, the median price of the new listed properties. So each week you have the set of homes that get listed for sale. And I love, I love this as a measure, as a leading indicator for where sales prices will be in the future. So the homes that get listed for sale this week are what we, what we call the, the wisdom of the crowds, where the crowds are the, the sellers and the listing agents. And, and as you go to price that home, you know, how much traffic was at the previous one? You know, how many uh, bidding, if there was a bidding war, how quickly they're going. And if they're not moving, we know we price it a little discount for the next one. If they are, we they we get a little price strength. And so what we can see here is when we look at the, the price of the new listings, that curve over time, you can see how the dark red line this year has been priced below last year. Home prices at or just below where they were selling last year. And this is across the country. Um, and so what we can also see is in that light colored, the light red line last year, you see how it compresses with the tan line from the year before in the second half of the year. So when that compresses, that was because there was price pressure. Each new listing late last year was like, well, if we're going to sell this one, we're going to, we need a little discount. And so you could see those, the, those folks doing that discounting. And so they they get listed now and they take offers in July and it closes in August. And then you hear about those in September. Uh, that's the typical cycle. But you can see it right now when you look at the price of the new listings. So one of the things that'll be interesting to see is in July, in July, we had a mortgage rate spike last year and, and we could see demand stopped abruptly, supply stopped abruptly and prices ticked down. So if you were listing in July last year, you knew that you'd missed the, the earlier window. And so you did a price, you did a discount. And uh, so you could see that. And so by July, I wouldn't be surprised to see our dark red line above the light red line, which implies then, you know, homes that sell later in the year will actually have a slight price increase year over year uh, over 2022. And so again, like I mentioned, you know, by July, we could have uh, home prices up year over year, inventory down year over year, mortgage rates down year over year. And, and wouldn't that be a surprise? Um, let's switch to pendings. So these are the, um, all the homes in contract. And in this, each bar are the total account in a given week of the total number of homes in contract. These are single family homes across the country. Um, there are 389,000 houses in contract right now. Um, it is 15% fewer than last year. So, you know, we had a dramatic slowdown in purchase and you can see last year how each bar got really much smaller. We started 2023, started the year, with 35% fewer homes in contract than the year before. And so anybody who was, you know, the getting deals closed in the first quarter and the second quarter, 
had significantly fewer to close because they were all we could already see that uh, in the in the pendings numbers. Now we're fifteen percent fewer than than last year, so we've been catching up to that that big uh, drop in the last few weeks. As mortgage rates went from closer to six to closer to seven, we can see a slowdown in the in the pendings rate. More of these are closing, fewer are, are entering. So we'd been gathered, we'd been gaining ground on our last year. We started the year at 35% fewer in contract. We got all the way up to 14%. Now we're at 14, 15%. As rates are around 7%, you can see how that makes buyers pause. And so they don't make an offer, they delay, there are fewer homes in contract. And so like we've stopped gaining ground. Now, the good news is it's 15% fewer. It's not 35% fewer. Like that is, we can definitely feel that in the transaction volume. Um, and that has implications for later in the year. We also know that the that in mid-June, we peak the number of, of homes that are in contract and starts ticking down. Um, and then it'll tick down big after the 4th of July. So the question is, is the second half of this year, does it decline a little bit more slowly and we start gaining ground again on our uh, on, on the transaction volume from last year? So, you know, last year ended up with very few homes pending, very few transactions. So we should end up the year with more contracts happening uh, than we ended 2022. Um, unless mortgage rates spike, Mortgage rates spike. Let's say they go from around seven to seven and a half or eight. Like we had a scare around eight in September of last year, and uh, in in that case, inventory climbs and the number of pendings will fall dr dramatically. And you can see here, uh, in a given week in the middle of September last year, there's a big drop in the number of pendings. And so you could see July demand stopped, September demand stopped again. And so those were directly correlated with uh, with the, those spikes in rate in mortgage rates. Um, I don't forecast mortgage rates, so I don't know whether mortgage rates go up from here or down from here. I don't have any idea. A lot of folks are assuming that as inflation cools, that therefore uh, mortgage rates will start cooling with them. Well, there's a spread of the more the 30 year mortgage rate over the 10 year uh, bond interest rate. And that spread is really wide. So if that compresses, that would bring mortgage rates down. Uh, and, and so again, though, um, I don't know if that happens. If it does happen, we are likely to see an increase in demand a decrease in inventory, more homes going into pending, but we're still supply constrained, so so not a ton, but but more, um, but uh, and so and therefore price support in because supply is restricted, demand increases. So you could you could see that therefore we 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 do things like incentivize bidding wars and you end up with with price support surprising surprise support if that if mortgage rates for example get closer to five and a half by the end of the year I don't know if that happens um uh, but that's what we should expect so if you have a buyer in the market now um you could ask them what they expect is going to happen with mortgage rates if they think mortgage rates are going to fall, they may be saying, hey, I want to wait because I think mortgage rates are going to fall. That's a fair assumption. They, they uh, may also want to know what happens with more mortgage rates. If mortgage rates fall, you're going to have less selection than you do now. You're going to have more competition, bidding war competition, and you're going to have, you're going to have uh, likely home prices pushing higher. So be careful if that's what you're expecting. They may the market may be reacting very differently than what you're expecting to happen if mortgage rates fall in the future. But it's it's a it's a great way to understand and help a, a buyer um, understand what they might be facing if they're expecting rates mortgage rates to fall from here. Uh, so then let's look at the the price of the homes in contract. You can see that uh, the the dark red line here is this year. These are the median price, median ask price 
of all the homes that are in contract. And we are 1.8% lower than last year. Tick down this week. So $380,000. Uh, $159 is the median price of all the homes that are in contract right now. And um, and so that ticks down in June. We usually hit the peak in May. Um, and as we have those discounts that happen later in the year, you can see that the median price ticks down. What we don't know is, is does the, the current level of demand uh, allow for... Um, the this the dark red line to stay elevated, especially in October, November, December of last year, they elevated. So we end the year with home prices increasing, uh, but it's going to be really close. It's not going to be increasing by a lot. If it's decreasing, it's not going to be decreasing by a lot. You know, one point eight percent below last year, somewhere in that range. It's basically unchanged from a year earlier. And so when we look at these are pendings, and and so they're in contract now. Homes that are in contract now close in July or August. And so we can see then the future sales prices where they're where they're going to be because we already know the year-over-year -year comparison there. What's interesting though is if we look at just the homes that went into contract this week, they're already above last year. Uh, the median price of the newly pending homes. Uh, each week, so the bar here is the ones that went into contract in that given week. After that spike in mortgage rates last year, you can see how quickly the home prices dipped in June and July, and then again in that's in September. And so, you know, when we talk about how, you know, markets like Phoenix had home price declines year over year, it's like it happened in June, July, that right at the end of June, beginning of July, and it happened in September. And mostly the rest of the time, the 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 prices were were unchanged. It's why you know when we came into this year, you could see that that um, home prices were not declining, even though the year over year comparisons were bad because we had these we had the second half of the year um, declines. What we're getting to now is that the comparisons this year versus last year are getting to be easier because we had these big moves down last year. So um, we're at this point, just one week now where the new, the newly pending homes at 383,490, like that's 3% higher than last year at this time. And we don't yet have a, you have an adjustment down. Now they, they will adjust down a little bit in the second half of the year. Um, and so it could tick down a little bit in, at any given time and get closer to the, the pink line, the light red line from last year. But what, what it shows us is how our year-over-year -year comparison is su suddenly easier. And so by later in the year, the reports will be home prices are up year-over-year. -year. You can see that home prices are, you know, and, and so the headlines will shift later in the year from a negative bent to a positive bent in terms of home price changes. Uh, and again, you know, for your buyers and sellers, um, they should know that that that's about to happen. The headlines are about to start changing to home price gains year over year, and we can see it because the 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 ones in the in contract. Um, and now, and for the other leading indicator that I like to spend time with, and then we'll go into the local uh, in the local markets. I like to to use the percentage of homes on the market with price reductions as a leading indicator of where sales prices will be in the future. So homes are on the market now, if they don't get their offer, they take a price cut in July, then they get an offer and they maybe get the offer in, at the, in July or August and they close in September. We can see that because the homes that are now, there's only 30, just over 30% of them that have had price cuts, we know that there's enough demand that the future sales of those homes will have price support. So again, we can see that the prices that'll close later in the year are not going down because the people that are on the market now have their offers, they have buyers, they have traffic at the open homes, they have multiple offer scenarios. And so the prices are supported at these rates, at these prices, because we have limited inventory and, and more buyers in that. Now, last year, the light red line we could see in September, it 
it had peaked and then it did a, a climb again. It started climbing. Price reductions started climbing in September and October last year. And that's because we had that last big spike of mortgage rates. So uh, went from six and a half, six, six and a half to seven and a half. And that really stopped. So now you're a seller. You're how, if you're stuck with your house on the market in September of last year, you watch your buyer traffic dry up to zero. Now you got to do price cuts. And so that could happen again, right? Mortgage rates could jump again. I, like I said, I don't, I don't forecast mortgage rates. Um, but in general, the curve here shows how we will in July have uh, have fewer homes with price reductions than 2018 and 2019, meaning more price support for the future. That's a leading indicator that really shows us how, like if you have a if you have home buyers right now who are sitting on the fence waiting for the crash, waiting for home prices to dip because they assume that the market must crash. Like this is a really powerful leading indicator of, of when they can expect that to happen. We could see last year in April, May, June, July, price re reductions were going from like 30% to 31 and a half, like big moves each week because a bunch of people were cutting prices. Those folks, your those buyers that are waiting for the opportunity should look for that. And if they don't see that dramatically increase in price reductions, then, then their bargains aren't, they're, they're not around the corner. Uh, and so we can use that as a, uh, as a gauge for the change in the market. And it looks like, you know, by July, you know, we'll have fewer price reductions in the last few years. Uh, we'll have, like I said, less inventory, more demand. You can see all the pieces in place. Okay, let's switch to local data. I'm going to start here. Let's, what I like to do here is, this is the Altos system. Uh, in the Alto system, we have uh, each of these. This is my account, and you can see that we, each Alto uh, account, you have your reports. These are your local reports for your zip codes. You can see, I can see how many people are reading my reports each week. Our contacts, this is who I'm sending my reports to. I have 132 new people in my database this week. Uh, and the campaigns, these are the emails that we're sending out to my contacts with my reports so that they can see, and I, I've got 14,000 of them who are reading their reports this week. Um, and But we're looking at advanced analytics. So this is fourth tab. And, and if you've been on these webinars before, you know that what I like to do is I've built a chart with the advanced analytics platform where I, I like to rank the markets with the highest price reductions. Um, and in this rank chart, and I just said rank 50 metro markets, uh, most price reductions, you can see that Sarasota, uh, Fort Myers, you can see the Florida markets are really dominating the, the, the most markets with price reductions. That's different from last fall when it was really the Western US markets that were at the top. Austin and Phoenix are still close to the top. Uh, but but have come have significantly come from 60% down uh, with price reductions down into the 40s. That's turned the corner. 63% in Phoenix, 63% of the homes in Phoenix in November, 63% had had price cuts, meaning there was nobody buying. But this year is a lot fewer price reductions. 45% is actually pretty normal for Phoenix. Uh, the 15, this is like crazy bubble, you know, uh, um, pandemic boom market time. Um, but because Phoenix has a lot of investors, a lot of out-of-town buyers, things like that, tends to have more uh, price reductions. So it tends to be more normal to be high there. But I think it's really been interesting that that you can see like Sarasota did not really have a correction down of home prices, of, of price cuts this year. Um you know, Fort Myers is increasing right now. So um, you can really see, here's Orlando up here in, in the top. And so you can really see that, um, the, That's I think it's really been fascinating to watch the, the Florida markets uh, turn, the, where, you know, the big boomiest markets like, like Boise, at one point last year, 64% 
of the homes on the market in, in Boise had had price cuts. Now it's 34%. So you can see a dramatically improved market in the Western US uh, markets. Um, okay, let's look at some reports. So I have Orange County, California up. Uh, so this is for the County of California. And what I wanted to show here was let's look at inventory in Orange County. Uh, Orange County has only 1,400 single family homes on the market. Normally it's about 5,000. Uh, it is just more than, just a, slightly, in fact, less than the pandemic lows of 2021. Last year at this time, you could see Orange County has already had significantly increases in in inventory. But in fact, most years, this is peak inventory time for Orange County. And so Orange County is not going to get, you know, 2,000, 3,000 homes by the end of the year. It's like maybe get to 17, 18, 1900 uh, before it starts ticking back down. Uh, really a dramatic change from last year. You can see, you know, Orange County, uh, high end, expensive real estate, Six million is the high end, but here anything under a million bucks is going in 14 days. You can see there's there's plenty of immediate sales that happen here. There's uh, there's bidding wars or at least multiple offer scenarios. Even if the bidding wars are not doing overpriced bidding, uh, they are like at asking, but but multiple offer scenarios. When things are going in 14 or 21 days, you can really see that. And really anything under two and a half million in um, in Orange County has the has the attention let's shift gears to a different price point entirely in cincinnati so so the central and midwest and and uh northeast markets have actually had the most price resilience this year they've had the most demand least changes in supply and so um this is median price for the cincinnati metro market and you could see we had um, the, the dots are where we have the peak home prices for the year. Uh, and we are at record home prices in Cincinnati. They're at the peak for the year. They'll definitely decline for the second half of the season. But because we have so few homes for sale, let's look at inventory here. Yeah, Cincinnati is like, you know, many of the, the the central and northeast markets where we're still at pandemic lows of available inventory. Um, did not climb at all out of the the lows. And this is this is as we were saying, you know, if mortgage rates fall, this falls more. If mortgage rates rise or stay elevated for multiple years, you can imagine that uh, in maybe three, four, or five years we have we can get back to having five or six thousand homes on the market if rates stay elevated for multiple years. Um, you can see down here uh, the the demand is you know under is five hundred thousand or under, and especially at the uh, two hundred thousand dollar range, it's fourteen days. In a lot of markets, especially some of the the older you know Rust Belt markets. The, the lower end homes, things that are like a hundred grand and under actually take longer to sell. Uh, they are, these are three bedroom, one, ba one and a half bath homes. Like there's, they're less and they're, se they're 76 years old. So they're, they're less desirable. Um, so there's often, you'll see that the low end is not moving the fastest, but really there's a sweet spot right in the middle. Uh, let's look at Las Vegas. Las Vegas is one of the classic boom and bust markets way up on the way up and and fast down on the way down. Um, this is median price in, in Las Vegas. So Cincinnati was obviously at record price. Um, Las Vegas is not. Las Vegas is still down year over year. So that you can see the dot from last year, um, but recovered some this year. Uh, and we can see that. So that's the list price in, in Las Vegas inventory levels. So this is a really fascinating chart. Last year, inventory was rising rapidly each week for 4,000, like 8% per week climbing in, in Las Vegas last year. And right now, not climbing at all yet. At the bottom for the year, we'll probably start ticking up the, the now the second half of the year, but it's a dramatically different market. And again, if rates 
uh, fall from here, that will probably accelerate. You can see, though, longer days on market in in uh, in Las Vegas. So, you know, this tells us that we have uh, it's still a much softer market than its boom times and certainly softer than than places like Cincinnati right now. Um, you can you can watch it happen in uh, in Las Vegas. Miami is has been the uh, the the strongest uh, Florida market for the the in the post uh, pandemic time right the the last year. So Miami has home prices up year over year, but past its peak and lightly likely starting to adjust down. Miami has um, uh, inventory wise is still really in the pandemic shortage era, does not have nearly as many homes as it normally does in the Miami metro market um, and probably starting to climb for the second half of the year in Miami. Um, so, you know, but we can look at price, price reductions in Miami. So this is the percent of homes with price cuts and you know, while last year this was climbing dramatically, we it's also declining pretty quickly this year. So 30% of the homes have had price cuts, where in the central Florida markets, it's like 45, 47, 48%. Um, and so Miami has had been on a different cycle than a lot of the inbound. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, likely Miami has like international money and has different dynamics than much of the rest of the state. Um, let's just do one more. I've got, uh, let's look at Raleigh. Uh, Raleigh is a, is a big, you know, boom market from inbound migration. Um, Raleigh has us showing less, uh, home prices just barely down year over year on its way up. Um, and let's look at inventory in Raleigh. So Raleigh has greater inventory than the last, uh, couple of years. And uh, but still significantly fewer than in, um, you know, pre-pandemic times. So this shows us that uh, migration to Raleigh slowed down this year and therefore fewer buyers allowed inventory to climb, did not um, gobble up as much as some of those markets that have uh, like even in the Midwest where there's no sellers. You know, if you're leaving your house in Cincinnati and you're buying in Raleigh, uh, you may, uh, you're likely not selling your super affordable home in Cincinnati. You're keeping an investment property and therefore inventory doesn't climb. All right, that's the whirlwind tour of the of the uh, local markets today. Let's do uh, here. As I mentioned, the, the uh, all of the data I talk about is available from Altos, but, but even if you're just using data from your MLS or someplace, Grab the ebook to understand how to talk about the data uh, in your business, how to use it, how to use it in social, how to use it in scripts, when to talk about it. Um, grab it. It's free. There's a link in the chat so you can go grab that uh, and, and download it if you don't have it already. That's all the time we have for today. As always, uh, you can go to altosresearch.com. And if you want, if I don't get time to talk about your local market, which I, you know, I only have a handful of uh, opportunities now. If you want to talk about your local market, go to altosresearch.com and book a demo. Just request time with our team. We'll look at your local market. We'll look at, we'll talk about how to build that into your conversation, what your people need to know now, and then how to automate it so you get the, the data to your customers, to your buyers and sellers, to your potential buyers and sellers. Some of those folks are on the fence and they need to know what's happening. They may be expecting um, mortgage rates to decline, but they may think that they're gonna, that's going to lead to more inventory. And the data shows that if mortgage rates decline, we're going to have less inventory available. And that's a different message than many of them likely are expecting. Um, so that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much. I always appreciate your uh, attendance and your attention. And uh, we'll talk to you all again very soon.